Out in the cold darkness of space lurks a monstrosity. A planet orbiting a star just 260 light years away may be one of the rarest types of worlds in nature. A so-called ultra-hot Neptune. The planet orbits a star in only 19 hours, so close that its atmosphere should have been lost long ago, a distant cosmic memory. And yet somehow this world holds on to an atmosphere that will allow astronomers to unravel its secrets. The arrival of LTT 9779b may hold the key in our understanding of one of the most enigmatic mysteries in the study of extrasolar planets. What is the Neptune Desert? Since the end of the Kepler space mission in 2018, we quickly learned that the extrasolar planetary systems were far more different than what we expected. The Kepler mission flew for nine years, launching in 2009, and for the first four years it observed the same around 150,000 stars in a fixed region of the northern hemispheric sky. Now Kepler confirmed that the diversity of planets was far greater than what we were accustomed to in the solar system, more so than we ever imagined. In particular, the planetary demographics we uncovered told us that super-Earths and mini-Neptunes, which are a class of planets with masses in the range of 2 to 10 times that of the Earth, were the most common outcome of the planet formation process in our galaxy. Of course, we have none of those in the solar system that we know of. But we also learned that larger Neptunes are relatively uncommon. Planets with physical sizes greater than around four times that of the Earth are only found to orbit a few percent of sun-like stars, and gas giants are rarer still. It's clear that the larger and more massive planets become, the rarer their numbers in the galaxy. Now, as the Kepler mission proceeded, and more and more pieces of the grand planetary tapestry were being uncovered, a striking region revealed itself, and not for the reasons you may think. When analysing how planets are distributed in distance from their host stars, combined with the sizes and masses of those planets, astronomers realised that one area of the parameter space was devoid of planets. The region in question is located very close to the star for planetary orbital periods of less than only three or four days. We found there to be many very small and dense planets, rocky super-Earths as it turns out, whilst we also found many massive gas giants with these orbital periods. However, what we're missing were planets with Neptune-like sizes and masses, and this gave birth to the Neptunian desert. The Neptune Desert is so dry, so devoid of planets, that the Kepler mission didn't find any bona fide members in this region, outliers if you like, but was able to really map out the borders of this region, and this is what you can see here. Here we can see the mass and radius of discovered planets, shown against their orbital periods, or distances, from the host star. The coloured trapezoids highlight the boundaries of this region, showing a striking cavity in the population distribution. Now much work has since been done to better understand the nature of this region. One obvious culprit for the paucity of planets is that of stellar photoevaporation. Orbiting so close to a star means that the radiation falling on the planet is huge, sufficiently hot in these cases to strip the planet of its atmosphere. Think about moving your finger closer and closer to a flame. The radiation increases following the inverse square law, such that if you half the distance between your finger and a flame, you double the amount of a radiation falling on it or, or heat. Same thing with planets under stars. However, the radiation falling on a planet orbiting a sun-like star in the Neptune desert can be a few thousand times the flux of radiation received by the Earth at its distance around the Sun. And that's because it can be around 50 or more times closer to the star. Now at these levels, the planet's upper atmosphere is heated to temperatures of 5 to 10,000 degrees Celsius due to the high energy ultraviolet and X-ray photons falling on the planet which means that the hydrogen gas of Neptune planets and gas giants can reach escape velocity, departing the world and causing serious mass loss through a hydrodynamic wind. 
The bulk of this type of mass loss occurs in the first 100 million years or so, since the young stars are more energetically active than older stars, releasing their high energy radiation at much higher frequency in those early years. But photo evaporation may not be the only game in town. The Neptune Desert has an upper and lower bound, and it seems that photo evaporation can't explain both regimes, particularly the upper boundary for the gas giants. The gas giants appear to be able to hold on to their majority of their atmospheres, even when they are very close to their host stars. However, if we can consider the effects of high eccentricity migration, particularly migration of the planet by tidal interactions with its host star, then the upper boundary can be reproduced. Tidal migration of planets occurs when worlds, initially excited into highly eccentric orbits through interactions with distant companion stars or other planets in the system, then they pass close to their host star. And the changing gravitational potential as the planet comes closer and closer raises tides on the star. And these tides are dissipated as heat in the stellar atmosphere through frictional processes. And the energy loss circularizes the planet's orbit, but with much, much shorter orbital periods than before, very close to the host star. Now, in a 2018 work by James Owen and Dong Lai, they were able to show that the combination of these two processes could explain both boundaries, when realistic values for the planetary and stellar parameters, along with, of course, the various timescales that these processes occur over, were input and utilised in their modelling. However, more work is needed to confirm these results, since others claim photo evaporation alone can indeed explain both boundaries, and it's clear that planets within the desert would help a lot. Now, by its very nature, we don't expect to find planets in the quote-unquote desert region, but there are always exceptions to the rule. The Sector 2 planet candidates from the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, dropped in late 2018, just before our observing run on one of the world's most precise instruments for measuring planet masses, the High Accuracy Radio Velocity Planet Searcher, also known as HARPS for short. The arrival of the TESS mission promised new planetary systems that would be ripe for detailed follow-up studies to learn about the nature of planet formation and evolution. Finally, a space mission that would survey the whole sky, looking for the telltale signatures of small planets, passing in front of bright stars, stars bright enough that we could study the planets in detail using instruments on the ground. Now I remember sifting through each and every candidate for those first runs, selecting those that would be amenable to HARP's observations, and then suddenly one jumped out at me, an extreme outlier in the ensemble of candidates, a planet with a size a little larger than Neptune, but orbiting its star in less than one day. Furthermore, the star was bright when compared to the usual brightness of stars that host transiting planets. This was a clear, high-priority target for me, and even though such candidates mostly turn out to be false positives, the urge was too great to resist, and so we would devote a large fraction of our harp's time to test if this could be a real oddball planet. Now, one of the graduate students, Nicholas Kurtovich, from our New Worlds Lab group, would be carrying out the observations with harps at the Iso La Silla Observatory in northern Chile. Harps uses the Doppler method to search for planets, a technique that applies high-resolution spectroscopy to measure the radial velocity of a star. That's the velocity towards us and away from us due to the slight gravitational tug of an orbiting planet. Now, Harps allows us to measure these velocities to better than one metre per second precision, sufficient to detect planets of only a few Earth masses with short orbital periods. So each morning I eagerly got up early to download the velocities and spectra from the previous night's observing run, checking the spectra for any irregularities that could maybe indicate the presence of a blended stellar intruder. None were present. More fun was adding the velocities to the time series each night and building up the radio velocity curve, allowing us to constrain the mass. And with only four nights of data, we knew we were onto something exciting as the mass constraints we were finding were coming in at around 30 times that of the Earth. 
In the meantime, we also took additional spectra to help with the characterization of the host star. Using the network of robotic shell spectrographs, or NRES, and the Tillinghast Reflector Shell Spectrograph, or TRESS, in addition to our HARP spectra, we were able to show that the star has a mass and radius close to that of the Sun, is super metal rich, with almost twice the amount of iron in its atmosphere that the Sun has, it is a slow rotator and so inactive, and has an age of around 2 billion years. Now, highly sensitive adaptive optics observations were also made to rule out background stars that are positioned very close to LTT 9779 on the sky, those that could be causing the transit events in the TESS light curve. You see, the TESS pixels cover a large angular area on the sky, around 22 arc seconds, which is large enough that we can commonly have these background contaminants infecting our light curves. However, both NEOP2 at the Keck Observatory and HRCAM at the SOAR telescope confirmed the lack of any contaminating sources. In the end, and by combining our 32 HARPS velocities with 18 lower precision velocities from the Corelli spectrograph, we were able to confirm the planetary nature of the test transit, while measuring a mass of 29 Earth masses. Additional ground-based photometric follow-up from the Next Generation Transit Survey, or NGTS, and the Las Cumbres Observatory, LCO, were also made to help confirm the transits at higher sensitivity, further constraining the orbital mechanics and providing a more precise radius measurement. We found a planet radius of four and a half times that of the Earth, therefore arriving at a planetary bulk density of 1.7 grams per cubic centimetre, very similar to that of Neptune in our own solar system. So first of all, Confirming that such an extreme planet could indeed exist is groundbreaking. But the real work comes now when we try to understand how such a system could form. Given that LTT 9779 is very rich in metals, it's highly possible that the planet was significantly more massive in the past, since these gas giants with these inner orbits preferentially form orbiting metal-rich stars. The dominant process of planet formation is through core accretion, which posits that planets grow through the accumulation of small dust grains whilst orbiting the star buried deep inside a protoplanetary disk. When the growing planetesimal accretes enough material to reach around 10 Earth masses or so, there's no stable core envelope solution. Its gravitational field is strong enough for gas to collapse onto the growing core, quickly building up to become a gas giant. Our structure models indicate that LTT 9779b is dominated by a huge rocky core, since only around 9% of the planet by mass can be in the gaseous hydrogen helium form. This means that it has a core mass of close to 30 Earth masses, which surely would have crossed the critical core mass threshold, and so we could expect that it was previously a much more massive planet. Massive planets also have deeper gravitational potentials, allowing them to hold on to their upper atmospheres for longer periods of time. If LTT 9779b formed in its current position with its current mass, it would likely have lost more than the current mass of the planet, ruling out such a scenario. It could, however, have formed much further out in the system and then migrated into its current orbit. Migration is an integral part of the planet formation and evolution process. Moving giant planets from their large formation distances to short periods, for example. The problem with this hypothesis is that the main migration pathway is through interactions between the planet and the protoplanetary disk in which it's forming. Yet disk lifetimes last only 5 to 10 million years, whereas the most active phase of the star happens on a longer period, in this case up to around 80 million years. Therefore, the planet would still have lost a large fraction of its mass unless the migration happened through another process over a longer time scale, such as collisions with other bodies in the system. Our modelling revealed that if the planet was originally a Jupiter-mass world, it would have lost only 3% of its mass through photoevaporation, and therefore it would have had to have lost the majority of its atmosphere through another process. A possible way to do this would be by Roche lobe overflow of the planetary atmosphere. 
As LTT 9779B migrated into the star, it came too close, filling what's known as its Roche lobe, meaning the star's gravitational potential overcomes the potential of the planet, allowing the less bound parts of the upper atmosphere to transfer onto the star through an accretion disk. By transfer of angular momentum between the planet and the disk, outward migration of the planet then occurs, and the transfer therefore shuts off, but after losing significant amounts of material from the planetary atmosphere, leaving behind the system we observe today. Although these simulations produce similar results to the observations, some fine details still do not match, and therefore more modelling efforts are needed to fully grasp how this system has formed. So the future looks golden for the LTT 9779 system. The star is sufficiently bright and nearby that follow-up observations and modelling efforts from the ground and space will reveal a lot about the planet's structure, chemical composition and evolution. Given it's unlikely that we will ever find another LTT 9779b analogue orbiting such a bright star, we must work hard to extract as much detailed information as possible from this diamond in the cosmic rough. Improbable planets like this can provide opportunities to study the nature of planets in ways previously not thought possible, and so we must take advantage of this opportunity.